thanks everyone for coming and joining us online. Um, and thanks to the Trinity Law Room Hub uh, who has given me this excellent opportunity to be here uh, for two months. Uh, to Trinity Center for Literary and Cultural Translation for gazing with me about this opportunity and organizing this event. And to all the colleagues at both Trinity and DCU uh, for giving me feedback so far. Uh, the objective of the event is, as James said, very much networking, uh, bringing different disciplines together. And based on the survey results so far, uh, I think we have done quite a good job. Uh, we have marine biologists here, conservationists, uh, coming, people coming from environmental uh, sciences, ecologists, artists, musicians, translation studies scholars, as well as people who just love whales and dolphins. Uh, so I'm very happy to see you all here. The way we organize the event is I will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, uh, and then we will take the questions for about 15 minutes. After that, uh, the audience online will be sent a link to a Padlet. If you haven't used Padlet before, please do not worry. You don't have to have even the uh, account or anything. All we will do is we invite people to write who they are, where, how, why they are interested in this topic and whether they would like to network with other people, you know, if they are marine biologists, if they want to work with artists, just introduce yourself and say, here I am, I'd like to do something with you. Okay, so this is for the online audience. The in-person audience, I will invite you to do some group work for about 20 minutes, half an hour, if you have the time. So please do not disappear at the end of the Q&A if you have the time and energy by then, okay? Thank you. Uh, as I said, we are I'm addressing really different disciplines today. And uh, inevitably, some of the things I will say, I mean, I'm trying to make it as accessible as possible. Therefore, some of the things I will say will be rather cursory. So my apologies in advance to any discipline. If you think, oh, this is too, it's not going deep enough. It's because I need to be able to explain these concepts to everybody. I will use the word station quite often for those of you who are not coming from marine sciences, it just means dolphins and whales. It's an umbrella term. Uh, the plight of stations has been a central issue in biodiversity loss, attracting more attention compared to other species, other marine species. This is partly to do with the affinity humans feel with other mammals, and partly because they are just so iconic. Sometimes they are referred to as pandas of the ocean. The reason I have focused on them is because of the availability of musical material that uses their vocalizations. So it was quite a pragmatic decision for me, as well as the fact that I love them. But I'm under no illusion that they can or should be saved on their own with little attention to all other life forms they share the oceans with. My work is based on three premises. The first one is findings and breakthroughs in marine biology need better outreach and stronger impact on policy decisions and conservation. And I'm hoping that those of you coming from these areas will agree with this. Uh, this requires careful attention to how marine environment is portrayed outside the sciences. We can you can argue that we can get this information through popular science or documentaries, but even those, they need conscious effort on the part of the audience to go and find those documentaries and popular science journals. While art and music kind of tends to creep into our lives, even, even when we don't realize it. It's, it, it's everywhere. So I believe that since we do not yet have a widely accepted means of communication with other species. Artists and musicians act as translators, mediators in interspecies communication, especially in the eyes of the general population. And this comes with crucial ethical responsibility. And my final premise is that humanities may have a few insights to share with both audiences. When I say humanities, I will mainly talk from the point of view of my discipline, translation studies, but I will also use ideas from ecofeminism and continental feminist philosophy. My work currently is a response to recent calls within translation studies to go beyond lingual centricism 
expand its disciplinary boundaries to interspecies translation, mainly by Michael from who is sitting here, uh, and pay more attention to the various forms of translation going on in the diverse science systems of the modern human world. And because my audience is so diverse, I thought I would start with that just one slide, because it's not too long, crash course on whale songs, and mainly humpback whale songs. Only five whales are thought to sing. These are blue, bowhead, fin, minky, and humpbacks. And uh, their songs vary in terms of the range, uh, the frequencies according to their body size, and also the distances they can reach. In the case of blue whale, it's up to 125 miles. The most complex songs are thought to be those by adult humpback whales, male ones. And their songs can last anything between five minutes to 30 minutes. And their song cycle, which means they repeat the same song, can go on for hours up to a full day. We don't know why they sing exactly. The dominant hypothesis remains that it's for mating purposes. But more recent interpretations, such as the male uh, being alone and singing alone, altruistically bonding with and supporting each other over long distances demonstrate the difficulty inherent in translating station communication, as well as the seemingly unavoidable anthropomorphism. There are about 14 distinct populations of humpbacks around the world, each with their own anthems of the song each year. These populations uh, also they have not only their own dialect. But uh, each whale singing the same sequence of sound, the same sounds over a period of time. But what makes it more interesting for the bioacousticians and musicians is that the songs evolve. Um, all humpbacks in one area sing variations on the same songs on a yearly cycle, but gradually, as the whales collectively create new phrases and patterns in synchrony, the song evolves over several months. In addition, in the western and central South Pacific region, songs can undergo dramatic cultural revolutions, where the song type from one population is rapidly adopted by the neighbor, neighboring population. Then in my talk, I will also refer sometimes to spectrograms, this image that you see here. Uh, these are the images used to indicate frequencies and pitches, etc., of whale songs in linear fashion. Now that you're all experts, uh, I want to go to uh, go a bit back in the history and tell you how music in relation to stations has started. It started with this album, Songs of the Humpback Whale. In the 1950s, when the US military was recording Soviet submarines, sonar operators began to hear whale vocalizations amid all the anthropogenic noises. In 1968, one of these operators was authorized to turn his, his recordings over to two marine biologists, Roger Payne and Scott McQuay. Payne and then his wife, Katie Payne, made an album of extracts from, this, from these recordings. The album sold over 100,000 copies. It's the best selling nature recording in history. It won a Grammy Award. It became the touchstone for social, economic, and legislative efforts of the Save the Whale movement of Greenpeace. In 1979, 10 million copies of a flexibility containing extracts from the album were inserted into a national geographic issue and distributed over 25 languages. It's the largest single pressing in recording history. So it's not any famous pop singer, it's a humpback. <laughs> I want you to hold on to that idea. It's been, it was a major breakthrough of this time, quite often uh, remembered in relation to the first photo of the Earth from the moon. So people say this was as strong as, as that. But that my argument is that it also set the tone for the next 50 years. Artistic and musical productions since 1970s have consequently focused on either the, for lack of a better word, the pure awesomeness or their languages and culture, especially culture, 
as measures of their intelligence. From a translation studies perspective, this is an oscillation between two highly anthropocentric positions, departing from us. So it's a, either a neocolonialist exoticization, which may go like, oh, they are so different from us, and therefore intriguing, or a narcissistic benevolence. They are just like us. Therefore, they deserve protection. Here is obviously Narcissus looking at his uh, re reflection in the pond, and one could easily say that he probably didn't see any of the other creatures in those waters. The former position, exoticization, is, I would argue, akin to the treatment of Middle Eastern and Asian cultures by European colonizers. At the top, you will see the image of a harem, quite common painting for the time, which kind of imagined an orient. Colonialism often exoticized, orientalized, and infantilized its subject, created stereotypes, and produced an exotic alternative. It also robbed the colonized from a language of its own. Quoting Michael again, Michael Cronin, refusing to translate what the native were saying and writing in their own language became a necessary precondition for unconscionable slaughter and territorial dispossession. One way of silencing is to disassociate, disassociate communication forms from their pragmatic origins and turn them into commodities, as in the case of the creation of whale music. In the words of environmental geographer Max Ries, whale music has been an ideological contract from the very start. Presented as music, the sounds of whales became communicative, personally fulfilling, and community constituted all at once for the environmentalists of the 20th century. It was musical interpolation. So it wasn't shrieks or deep guttural noises of the whales. The more people called this music, the more it became music. This has huge implications in terms of the representation of species today and the way we relate. In a post title, Musical Manipulation, the Power of Background Music in Wildlife Documentaries, science communicator Madeline Glenn asks, could we, could, sorry, could what we currently see as harmless entertainment actually be affecting who we decide to protect? Subtly telling us what species we should care about and those which we shouldn't. Music is always used in nature documentaries to fill in what is referred to as the awkward silence. But the choice of music has a direct impact on the perception of the viewers. It has been demonstrated that the ominous background music that often accompanies shark footage in documentaries, and it doesn't have to be this breathtaking footage, has a direct impact on public support for shark conservation despite the fact that they have suffered more than 70% decline in their population since the 1970s. Coming from a translation studies and music background, Lucille de Blush questions the impact of wildlife documentaries populated with music and notes. Music, at least music which contains no lyrics, does not require translation, but it can translate, if not semantically, can semantically, making sense beyond different tongues, but also across different non-semantic idioms. Over the years, the fictional tour of the stations, their representations, have, has largely become one of peace and calm. When you search for whale songs on the internet, most of the results will be videos of ambient music, meditation, self-help books with the theme of whale being. I will give you just one example of an album because there are so many, but this is quite a representative one. It's Hot Tune, released in 2015. The album is promoted on its website as a musical collaboration between Compact Wales and renowned international ambient composers. The website argues that the album is, I'm quoting here, suitable for more than just aquariums. In fact, Hot Tune enhances everyday life. The way of human music can be played anywhere, work environments, 
fine restaurants, cafes, gyms, yoga studios, meditation halls, boudoirs, tea huts, and at home. And of course, the new colonial and capitalist appropriation of spatial communication is serious. Even though this particular album's net proceeds actually go to two charities, Ocean Alliance and Blue Mark, so one for the ocean and one for the benefit of the human. I know I'm coming across as very sarcastic, and I don't want to. I know that all these you know, works are done with plenty of good view, but in English, we also have this proverb saying, the road to hell is paved with good good intentions. The key works from the reviews of Fortune, again, compiled on its website, go something like this. A serene, textural album of ambience, all in the face of something larger than contemporary, beautiful and esoteric, tender and evocative, an ancient sonic haiku, mesmerizing. The whales would approve. <laughs> Shimmering rushes, transcendental minimalist, soothing. For anyone remotely familiar with what stations have to navigate on a daily basis, these qualifiers ring not only how, but outright dangerous in their recommendations. And I'll just list a few plastic pollution, noise pollution due to commercial shipping, military exercises, seismic surveys of the oil industry, depleted habitats due to overfishing, trolling, and climate change, entanglements in fishing gear, legal conditions with marine dust. So far, I have talked about the first position, what I refer to as exotization. So now I want to come to this. I want to jump in and take a photo. <laughs> I'll come to this intelligence and culture issue. This is James Nestor, author and journalist, criticizing Japan and Iceland for continuing to hunt sperm whales at the TEDx. TEDx. He says, if we are able to prove their intelligence and their capacity for communication, we might be established, able to establish in some real ways. It's going to be a lot harder to kill an animal that can speak its name. Honestly, when did we ever stop killing creatures who can speak their name? Here, Nestor is referring to the uh, scientific uh, findings that sperm males, orcas, dolphins actually do use clan names, pot names, as well as individual clicks to actually identify each other. So if we do translate that into human terms, yes, they have names and surnames, but at the moment that doesn't help too much. This is uh, National Geographic and it's a special issue in May 2021 on oceans. The cover story was all about whales. And again, it starts secrets of the whale. In a bit of the previous uh, mystification of the whales. Well, I'm more interested in the subtitle. I don't know whether it's legible or not here. It says they're playful, social, and curious, just like us. I love that the emphasis is on positive attributes and not on negative ones like greed, hatred. Uh, it's a testament to the power of anthropomorphism. We are using these creatures to reflect the best of us to ourselves. This is uh, a visual art based on uh, station communication by Mark Fisher, software engineer and founder of Aquasonic. 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 He wasn't very content with the spectrograms I have just shown you, the linear ones. He argued that if we use wavelets, some mathematical formula I do not understand, I'm sure mathematicians will know better than me, he turns these whale songs, like a minky, Song, for instance, into these mandalas, flower petal shapes. So it's a different form of art, going through many stages from the organizations of the whales to a very visual representation. He also says, with a little bit of investigation, we may be able to show some evidence of culture in a non human species in ways that we no doubt. I want to now discuss with you what the problem of this approach may be through using the perspectives of ecofeminism, as well as feminist continental philosopher's work, Rosie Braidotti's work on post -humanism. But before I do that, I need to take you to some 
very basic um, idea, taking you to dualisms which underlie our fractured worldview today. They go a long way back, all the way to Plato and Descartes, and I suspect the one you are most familiar with is this dichotomy, mind and mind versus body, mind slash body, I say, okay? But there are many others we are familiar with in our Western cultures. Culture, nature, man, woman, master, slave, us, them, human, animal, and or plant, basically anthropos and the rest of the world. These distinctions, these dichotomies are so clear to us from our indoctrination, to our school, to our society, that we do not often stop and criticize it. In the humanities, we are very, we, we do criticize it, but in other disciplines, less so. Ecofeminists, among others, have exposed the underlying ideologies behind these dichotomies. By constructing these divisions, the former part, mind, culture, man, master, us, anthropos, defines itself as opposed to the latter, but also exploits and feeds off from. Difference can also imply inferiority, that the second part is inferior to the first part. And this can have lethal connotation for those who are branded as others, reduced to disposable bodies. This is human, anthropos, da Vinci's Vitruvian man, his conception of ideal body proportions. And it, it is ranked among the all time iconic images of Western civilization. However, it's not representative at all. It's male, white, European, able bodies, heteronormative, among, among other things. And by challenging the centrality of anthropos, Ecofeminist and Bradotte's work, which I will come back in a minute, they question the boundaries that are constructed between Anthropos and its others. And these others, in the words of Jordi Braidotti, are the sexualized others, the racialized others, and the naturalized others. Women, different genders, races, animals, plants, basically the earth. There are transversal and intersectional links between these others, even though they have their own very specific struggle in different domains and locations. The source of their sufferings can be traced to the control and dominion of patriarchy, capitalism, imperialism, the exceptionalism of anthropos. If you are not convinced, this week uh, it was in the news that over the last one year, more than six hundred dolphins washed on the shores of France. Did anybody read that news? Uh, it's as a result of uh, fishing practices, certain fishing practices. And some of the dolphins' bodies were mutilated with and um, homophobic slurs were carved onto their bodies. Not a nice example, but I just want to move my point. Instead of the dualism, which seems to be messing up our world, Brayden's work on post feminism relies on monistic ontology coming from Mormon. So we don't have the duo anymore, it's Mormon. Monistic ontology drawn from a vital materialist philosophy, which itself is based on contemporary readings of Spinoza, Deleuze, and Godfrey, as well as molecular biology. I mean, just when you read this, you know that I don't have time to go into the details. I will try to sum it up in one syllable. According to Braidotti, matter, including the specific slice of matter that is human embodiment, is intelligent and self organizing. And it's the same for that plant over there, it's the same for any, any living thing that you see in this room, but as well as it goes into non human matter as well. This means that matter is not dialectically opposed to culture nor to technological mediation, but continues with it. Brodotti, instead of the dualistic world we were just spoken about, suggests the concept of Zoe, non-human definition of life as Zoe. It's a dynamic and generative force, she argues. And this force cuts across 
and reconnects previously segregated species, categories, and domains. She argues that zoe-centered egalitarianism should be the core of post-anthropocentric change. She also argues for transpersonal subjectivity in order to curb the excesses of human exception. I mean, this is heavy metal, especially for 613 meaning. So I tried to find some image that can visualize this. And the closest I could come is this one. Are you familiar with this? It's quite common in Asia. It is not Broidotti. It is, I don't know the origins of it, but I think it comes as close as possible to what she ends with. So on one hand, we have anthropocentrism with anthropos at the top, other human and non-human non life and non-life entities in the second layer, third layer. You can see the station uh, just at the bottom here. Uh, to get out of this kind of thinking, people who want to talk about a zoe centered, a geo centered, or a cosmo centered worldview try to imagine the universe like this. I'm, I'm not totally happy about this either. I don't have time to go into this, but this is the best we can get at the moment. So, does, does that make sense? How, how much of a shift in view it means. When we talk about the intelligence of stations, when we emphasize their language, their culture, quite often it is done for the purposes of establishing some rights for the station. The problem with the rights discourse is that it is trickling down from the top of the pyramid very, very slowly to the other layer, and maybe from that layer other layer and so on. It's a very small process. So this is one problem. So my questions are, would stations ever benefit from the ever-expanding consciousness of human anthropos? Do they have the time? Do we have the time? How about the rest of the marine environment? How about sea urchins? How about rivers, forests, fungi? Where do we start? Do we need to start? And who is we? Who gave us the right to distribute rights? Any discourse promoting rights, be it on you know, station rights, animal rights, indigenous rights, women rights, LGBTQ rights, risks reinforcing the very journalisms that and the very, very laden dichotomies we have just talked about. They put the anthropos back onto the throne. This is a quote from Marie Lotti. She says, the emphasis on the logic of rights results in neglecting all the role of feelings, empathy, and compassion, and more complex forms of ethical relationality towards one another. However necessary, it's not sufficient to address as complex an issue as contemporary human animal interaction in the frame of environmental destruction. However benevolent, such a move reasserts an anthropocentric hierarchy between species and paradoxically confirms the binary distinction human-animal by extending the prerogatives of one category, the human, to others. Imputing human entitlements to non-humans by applying to them the deeper notion of individualism may turn out to be a poison child. So I would argue that because of this, trying to prove or disprove the existence of cultures in station or any other non-human animal is a moot point. It doesn't get us where we want to go. So if either of the anthropocentric positions I have discussed so far does not seem to be doing the trick, where does it leave us? <clears throat> if you cannot remember anything else from this presentation, I want you to remember this slide at least. How to produce science and art in the age of the post-human, as I have just described it to you. And when you are memorizing this slide, I would invite you any person that can read just to move a bit and stretch because we have another 15 minutes to go. Online people, I hope you are doing exactly the same. I have put signs in the brackets here because the examples I will give from now on mostly relate to science, but I believe the same questions are crucially relevant to science as well. I will focus on three artists and their projects, uh, which partially addresses this question and explores 
what the new ethics of translational representation of spatial may look like. There are a few others, but for the lack of time, I will focus only on this. The first work is by Annie Lewandowski, a US based composer and programmer. She has focused on stations since 2017, working closely with Katie Payne and her recordings in Hawaii. Her first work in this area is Cetus, Life After the Life, uh, which was performed in 2018. But here I will focus on Silent, listening to another species on Earth. It's a collaboration between Lewandowski, uh, artist and coder Kyle McDonald, and sculpture artist and set designer Amy Lou. Siren is a 40 minute visual and sonic immersive installation. It's an excellent example of Braidotti's transversal subjectivity how human and non human animals, as well as material and machine, can come together to shed light on the flight of a species. And in extension, the oceans. The aim of the project was initially to integrate human and machine learning perspectives to reveal complex evolving songs. But instead, the project itself quickly evolved to draw attention to the lethal entanglement of between 300 to 650,000 species every year. Lewandowski describes the project as a deep listening experience of alarm, not of meditation. The materials used are lost and abandoned fishing gear salvaged from the sea floor in Cape Codway as part of the annual spring clean of the Center for Coastal Studies, when typically between 8 to 12 tons of drift nets, lobster lines, and other fishing debris are recovered. The choice obviously enhances the semiotic power of the installation. The gear was arranged in a landscape of shapes, mirroring the machine learning's visualization of contact song waves. And as listeners give their way through the piles of gear, speakers embedded in the debris project the decomposition of Hawaiian contact song detection. As the machine learning's visualization of contact song unfolds in time, it illuminates the shapes of the surrounding marine debris with AI generated light and color, tracing the evolution of the song. Lewandowski and Payne recorded the songs together with Hawaii Marine Mammal Consortium in 2019. Here, I'd like to draw your attention to the listening element that is involved in the production of this installation and the both old and new technologies and materiality that were involved. In the process, new ways of listening was afforded by both ancient and modern techniques, such as listening through the hull of the boat, where the hull acts as a sort of sounding board for the song to pass from water to air, with the sound radiating skywards from the boat, as well as an HDI marine mammal hydrophone lowered 30 feet below the surface of the water to eavesdrop and record the whales singing the same song asynchronously and independently from tens of miles away providing incredible detail and a real sense of the oceanic atmosphere. The second work I'd like to focus on is Reflex Iron Orca by telecommunications engineer Aldo Vedanilla and video composer, musician, and designer of artistic systems, Robin Kerr. Reflex Iron brings the sonic world of orcas within the human range of perception. If you're not familiar about orca, it's also known as killer whale. I don't know the language. The Latin name is used as orca Latin. Installed at the Special Sound Institute in Budapest, the installation enacts the experience orcas undergoing captivity, presented in stark contrast to the freedom of communication in their natural environment. The tank is acoustically modeled to human proportions, immersing the audience in the unhealthy sonic environment of captivity. The installation first equates the audience with the family calls of the orcas, call and response, used to identify with their call. A sequence of the capture of an orca follows, presumably manufactured, sonically representing the cries of the orca, its family, the horn and engine of the boat, a cacophony compared to the first part. So the first part. The final part is a reimagining of what the captivity sounds like for an orca in a tank. Lack of distance for the sounds to reach great distances. The distort, sorry, lack of distance for the sounds to reach us. The distortion, sound reflecting back from the concrete and glass walls. 
such as vibration from the cleaning uh, tanks, engines, music from the show, people applauding or banging on the glass. This perspective is, however, difficult to translate because Orca's brain structure is very different from the human's. It allows a faster processing time compared to us. And this was something they had to consider when building the installation. Robin Kirk sheds light on the translational aspects of their project, not only in terms of translating the scientific data to produce this artistic work, but also the difficulty of translating the corporeal and experiential experience. He says, the perceptual factors of space determine how we interpret the sound and how it relates them to the visceral connection. That's definitely part of the research, like how do you translate that? It's of course all based on as much calculations as I know about the subject and trying to improve. At the same time, you have to make a lot of translations, as you, because we will do that in the video at this stage, you did with the space, for instance, like modeling the space to human proportion. Also, Maybe frequencies that are almost soothing to us can be very frustrating or extremely anxious for us. So we have to think about how can you take that frequency range and put it in a range that is more present and anxious for humans so that you get that same feeling, the same physical reaction. Does this sound familiar to translation study scopes? A bit of neither Goldman almost. I'm saying you know, how do you get the same response from your own? These concepts are very familiar in my discussion. Yet these various forms of translation have to be carried out under strict time and space constraints. So it continues. Once the orca is living in captivity, it might live there for the entirety of its life. And now we put that in three minutes. And after three minutes, everybody is released from that experience. These are complicated questions. How do I translate that? And how can I give that experience and give that impact on the real suffering without having to keep people for the rest of their lives? The last artist I would like to introduce is Ariel Cusick, a Mexican musician and inventor making resonance instruments to communicate with nature. His first instrument, Nereida, the first one and the second one here, was a submersible cylinder capsule, a cast tube of fused cords with ten high tension harmonical strings, copper head and four carved wooden legs. The cylindrical shape and the cords help to receive the signals from marine mammals and echo back, while both the cords and the strings generate a harmonic echo. In the Pacific Ocean, where it was submerged, its subtle vibrations invited a chorus of responsive sounds from whales and dolphins. Nereida, and I'm quoting music here, was designed as a physical container for material language whose intrinsic characteristics, comprising statements and meaning, could be interpreted by the sonar vision of station. In 2015, music was commissioned to create Holland Holoturium, an underwater resonance instrument designed again to communicate with station. It was launched in the Gulf of California, designed to be submerged at great depths with a solid and armored external structure. In contrast, its interior forms an awkward core housing a small living plant. I don't know whether you can see this. I mean, the cactus people. And a string instrument fashioned from maple and pina wood. Its forays into the sea are conceived as offerings and are part of communication projects with the station. One could argue that Guzik's invention are part of a respectful acceptance of authority on Zoe egalitarian terms. He actually refers, he says, we have a civilization, they have a civilization, we, we are waging a one-sided war on them, and this is the best we can do. We need to kind of communicate with them in a different way. So in this communication, he says, we emphasize beauty, subtlety, and silence over spectacle, superficiality, and noise. In the face of big data's rising sureness, we have chosen to work with direct signals, leaving behind the information overload. All my machines are resonant or empathy as an axis. Use resonant or empathy as an axis. See, all open associate resonance and empathy. They are analog instruments, creeping organic and Our vision as a collective responds to a present and intimate need for 
promoting the re-enchantment of the world through resonance mechanisms. I have to say this idea of re-enchantment of the world comes up over and again, over again in eco feminism as well, especially in the work of Vandana Shiva and Mother Lisa. Our mission is also centered around the search for languages and forms of expression that transcend barriers between species and encourage the restoration of the fabric that unites all living beings. Annie Lewandowski, the first artist I have spoken about, uh, while they were recording the whale songs in Hawaii in 2019, she died, and this is her uh, in Hawaii, thanks for the photo permission. And she says, and I listened from the water. When humpbacks sing, they sing while stationary with their heads down. Basically, that's the posture I took to listen in the water. I lost the height and frequencies and directionality, but I did have the experience of immersion, which was thrilling, and one that I'm hoping to recreate in future pieces. I couldn't help but emphasize immersion, you know, for those of us coming from the language study background, immersion is such an important thing, right? When you're learning a new language. And also listen, when we are training translators. This is one of the first skills we try to impart for our students that they need to listen. Two years ago, I published a provocation piece titled Representing Experiential Knowledge Who May Translate Who? Uh, it was about translation of narratives based on experiential and corporeal knowledge, such as interpreting for a rape victim immediately after. Translating personal accounts of abuse at indigenous residential schools, war crimes, peak experiences, life changing events with potentially transformative powers, such as childbirth stories. I then expanded the questions to translating narratives found upon cultural formations which take the body and its experiences as a starting event, such as those emerging from racial, ethnic, sexuality, and gender based identity. I argued that rather than having the same or similar experience, being fully present, listening attentively and showing empathy should still form the basis of the translator's interpreter's response to the narration of any such experience. Being a secondary witness, and I'm taking this concept from the work of Sharon A. Fox in translation studies, highlights the possibility that one may not have the same experiential experience or knowledge, and yet still try to comprehend and translate someone else's experience through conscientious mediation, mediation. When I wrote that piece, I absolutely didn't have interspecies communication in mind. It was mainly intended for human communication. But the more I'm thinking about it, and uh, Trisha was also reminding me last week, uh, the more I think about it, the more I see that these premises should still form the basis of interspecies communication. So in the title of my talk, I said, towards a new ethics and representation. I hopefully didn't promise this, but these are my thoughts so far. I believe that whale music as we know it could be a thing of the past. I first wrote should there, and this is it, and the word could, but as you can see, my position is very much on the food side. We need to focus on materiality, both the actual matter that is used, such as the quartz, the glass, the concrete, the pinatoba wood, the fishing nets, all these matters that matter for the life of the station, and the conditions under which they live today. We need to have deep listening, acting as a secondary witness to their stories. We need to be aware of translation in all its forms, and we need to pay attention to translation in all its forms, as in the quotes by Robin Kirk in relation to reflex science. A Zoe-based egalitarianism, if we can wrap our, our heads really around the concept, if we really take it to heart, should form the basis of our interaction with the stations, reciprocity and mutual respect. And we need to be aware of our responsibility as scientists, artists, musicians, translators, towards the naturalized other of others of the anthropos who otherwise remain silent. You will have noticed that throughout my talk, I tried to use lots of images to keep you engaged with the talk. For this last one, I tried as well. 
I wrote whale and human. I wrote dolphin and human. Uh, there was nothing. All the images were from dolphinariums, whale strandings, whale bones in a museum, whale hunting, or whale watching, or people sitting on beached whale carcasses. We do not know what a post human relationship with stations will look like or with any other non human life form. But that should not stop us from working towards it. And I want to finish this with, I said I had no images, but then Nidi, just five minutes before the talk, came up with this one. She didn't know I was writing the book, but this might be, you know, as you can see, it's a, it's a girl swimming with a whale. So I want to finish on that image. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>